before the weekend, we had the discussion of how to move a submanifold, an object, inside a manifold. How to move it around, and whether you run into obstacles, or you could go around obstacles, and so on. We also saw that these questions had answers in terms of the dimensions. If you are moving a small dimensional thing in a large dimensional ambient space, it's easy to move. Whereas if you had a large dimensional, relatively large dimensional subspace moving inside a small dimensional ambient space, it's difficult. Overflow and that kind of idea. You are Let's begin by an example which serves as a quick revision. Can you visualize this surface? I hope you can. It's made of a tube. Hmm? Question, in what dimensional ambient space, Rm, for what m can this, let's call it cube knot, because it's a knot, K-N-O-T, no in French, which is made of a tube, be unknotted to an ordinary torus. A quick reminder, you remember from Friday that if you had an ordinary knot made of string, so this tube knot is made of surface, but if you have a knot made of string like this, you want to unknot it to this shape. You cannot do this in R3, in our space. That's clear. We cannot undo a shoelace. But we can do this if we can pass one thing after, pass another by going around it. And in what dimensional space can you do this unknotting? It's in your notebooks. Huh? It's not 4, I think. Or is it 4? It's 4. So it's in R4, you can do this. So in R3, you cannot, but R4, you can. I'm asking the same question but for knots made of tubes. So what do you think the answer is? How high a dimension do you need in the ambient space in order to do this? Huh? Any takers? Six. That's very good. How did you calculate six? You are genius. So, answer, why six? Why six? Do you remember if you are moving something of a certain dimension, k-dimensional thing? Yeah? What's the dimension of this tube knot? Two. Yeah? And you want to move it past itself. In other words, you want to move a two-dimensional object past a two-dimensional object. So k and l that I mentioned on Friday are both this tube. So two dimension plus two dimension. And then you calculate the overflow, minus m, which is the ambient room available, if you like. And if this is what? Strictly less than minus one, you succeed in doing this. If it's equal to minus one, you run into an obstacle, but at points, and so on. So that's the answer. And if you rearrange these pieces and so on, you get that m must be greater than or equal to 6. So in dimension 6 and above, you can undo all tube knots. Yeah? So next time you see, for example, next to Ames in that direction, um, there is a hose with which you can squirt water in case you come back from the beach and you're all full of sand. And if you twist it and knot it and so on, well, you can unknot it without cutting the tube not in R3, not in R4, not in R5, but if you go to six dimensional space or higher, you can do this. Okay, that's the kind of thing. Let's systematize this idea by introducing a piece of terminology. Imagine then, in general, that we are moving one object through some ambient space. Imagine we are moving 
at a manifold, and just think of it as a geometric figure, K um, in, an, in an ambient manifold M. You remember the abbreviation MFLD that stands for manifold, a strange term which just means geometric figure. And the picture we shall draw <coughs> is as follows. Let's say that this is what K looks like. Think of it as a string, if you like, but it has any dimension. Okay, so that's a one good example, any dimension. And I'm moving it, and as it moves, I'm going to finally arrive at this position. So I'm going to denote by k sub 0, the initial position, and k sub 1, the final position, where it gets to. And at intermediate stages, at time t, I'm going to denote this object by k sub t. Is that clear? So as time progresses from 0 to 1, from beginning to end, I'm moving this through space. Ooh, like this, like this, and then like this, and like this, and like this, and like this, and so forth. Okay? That's what we are doing. Now, um, in words, k sub t denotes the position of k at time t, which is between 0 and 1. 0 is the beginning, t, 1 is at the end. Okay? Suppose that we do this, a very reasonable, in fact, a commonsensical supposition, that you never self-intersect k. Okay. If at no time k, t never has self-intersections, at any t, In other words, I'm not cheating. If you move honestly, then we say that k0 is isotopic. The initial k is isotopic to the final k, k1. So the, that's the word, isotopic 2. And here is a little bit of symbol. We shall write this. As, I'm sorry that I'm coming to the next board. K0 and K1 are not equal, of course, because they are in different positions and they're not quite the same thing. In fact, they, have, they might have changed shape. But continuous deformation without self-intersection, they are, of course, homeomorphic, but there is more. We shall write it like this, which is, you can see, it's weaker than homeomorphism. Homeomorphism has two. Equality is straight, this is weak, weaker, and we shall say that they are isotopic to k inside m. By the way, I have to say something else here, I'm sorry. In m and write <coughs> this. So that's the notation, okay? As usual, in mathematics, when we define something, we have to check our understanding by having many examples. This is a good opportunity, perhaps, to give you a little speech. You know, when you learn mathematics, pure applied, you learn a lot of definitions. And let's say that you have a certain number of definitions. Okay? Maybe you learn 100 definitions. Also, there are a number of theorems and their number of examples to which the theorems apply. Now, a good piece of mathematics, if you are a good mathematician and you're being intelligent, if you're being economical, you should have many more theorems than definitions, and you should have many more examples than theorems. That's a good situation. Unfortunately, everywhere in the world, it happens that in textbooks, in classrooms, you learn 100 definitions. You have to memorize definitions, 100 definitions. And then you learn 10 theorems, and then there's only one example. <laughs> it should be the other way around. 
you should have one definition, 10 theorems, and 100 or even 10,000 examples to which the theorems apply. So please make sure that the inequalities are in this direction, not the other way around. In our case, we shall see some examples. Here, immediately, a surprising example. Can you visualize what this picture represents? I hope you can. And I hope that by now, after one week, you have gotten into the habit of drawing pictures quickly. Do you see what this picture really represents? I hope you can see exactly what I'm seeing. So if you like, this is a balloon. Hmm? But there is an arm that comes out of the balloon, another arm. And those two arms are, have sort of circular things, tor toric shapes, and then they are linked with each other. Is that OK? They are made of surfaces. They are not curves. OK? So one sort of balloon-like thing, another surface here, and they are linked like this. OK? Is that clear? Now, let's consider this surface and another surface, which is the same surface, but those two arms, if you like, are unlinked. Question, are these surfaces isotopic in R6? Monde? You answer the question for that case. Do you think these are isotopic in R6? You said that that knot is isotopic to that knot in R6, six dimensions. Do you think this is as topic to this in R6? The question is whether you can go, do, go from here to here. Whether a surface which has dimension 2 can go past another surface in dimension two, uh, of dimension 2 by going around the extra dimension. Do you think 6 is enough? Yes. Yes. yes, it's exactly the same calculation. So 6 is enough. Question, can you do this? isotopy in dimension 3. Let's take a vote. In dimension 3, so in our space, who thinks that it's possible to isotope this to this or this to this in dimension 3? Please raise your hands. OK, you do, you do. Two people only? Who thinks that, or oh, three people? OK, Saja in the corner. And who thinks that they are not isotopic in R3? You have to vote for one or the other. Who's too shy to vote? OK. Let's try to isotope this. Answer. And all those isotopes, yeah, isotopes, excuse me, are in R3. OK, so when I write this, I'm not going to write this M or R3 every time, but it means in R3. OK. First. Please imagine that I take this arm and then make this hole larger and larger. So what we shall see is the following picture. Maybe I'm not going to draw a face every time. OK, you agree that this is isotopic to this. I hope. It's, you can do it continuous deformation with no self-intersections inside R3. You can do this, yeah? I just made the hole larger. But now, I'm going to position these things a little differently.
this is of course isotopic to that. Yeah. This bottom has been expanded a little bit. Continuous, no self intersection. Now, we shall grab this in front and move it around over on this side and move, we shall grab this thing in the back and move it around over in the back. I slide those handles around on the surface. Okay. As a result, what we get is in fact, amazingly, this kind of picture. where this thing came from behind and this tube came from in front after I do this, okay? And it's clear that I can now deform this back to this. So the answer is yes. Surprising, huh? But true, I've, we've proved it. Completely rigorous proof because we showed every step, no step is being missed out. Yeah, uh, interesting example. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions about this example? Okay. Let's then see another example, but within the same heading. So it's still part of example number six. In contrast, let's consider two, again, torus knots, or the surface knots, tube knots, like this. You remember this uh, picture before, from before? It's probably still on the blackboard up there. And, and this standard torus. Okay, let's call this K0, let's call this K1, and let's say that these are, excuse me, inside R3, which is also inside R4. You can also regard it as inside R5, also inside R6, and what have you, okay? Now, in what dimension are they isotopic to each other? Well, first remark is that those two surfaces, if you forget about moving, they are already homeomorphic. In other words, they are topologically the same. One-to-one -one correspondence, bijection, if you know that kind of word, which is continuous in both directions. They are homeomorphic. It's just that they are positioned differently inside R3. Just the way you put it is different, but they are as shapes. The word is intrinsically, they are the same. So they're homeomorphic. But if you try to isotope one to the other, if you try to move, deform, deform them inside some ambient space, they are not isotopic. Rm for m equals 3, 4, 5. For in those dimensions, you cannot deform one to the other. If you try to do so, you run into self-intersection. And according to our definition, the isotopy should have no self-intersection in the course of the deformation. You should not cheat. However, example um, four shows that they do become isotopic in R6 and above. Okay. So you have to be careful about the concept of isotopy. Naively, intuitively, it just means continuous deformation, but you have to say in what ambient space you are deforming. If there isn't very much space, if you are in a small space, like a physical space R3, you cannot isotope many things. But if you go to a higher, if you are inside a higher dimensional space so that there are extra dimensions into which we can escape, then you can uh, isotope much more easily. 
Okay. So, in general, this is a very, very um, easy statement, so I'm not going to discuss it too much. Theorem 7. I think it's theorem 7, isn't it? So, if two things are isotopic, then those two things are homeomorphic. All we are saying is that if we manage to deform one object to another object, they must be topologically the same. Yeah. But the converse, the other way around, is not true. Even if they are topologically the same, for example, here and here, yeah, you may not be able to deform one to the other. Iso you may not be able to isotope one to the other, even if they are homeomorphic. Whether you succeed in isotoping or not has to do with how much ambient space you have, how much ambient dimension you have. Okay. Good. So, the converse, excuse me, but this is false. Homeomorphism does not imply isotopic. So the comment is that to know um, which submanifolds are isotopic to which ones, It is necessary, in fact, it is indispensable. Do you know what this word means? Indispensable? Indispensable in French is the same word. You cannot omit this step. You have to have this. Yeah. It's indispensable to specify in what ambient manifold we are trying to isotope. <coughs> Bless you. Okay. That is to say, often um, we hear beginners, students, and so on, say, oh, this is isotopic to this. But that's not the way to say it. You say, this is isotopic to this in this space. Because if you change the ambient space, it may no longer be isotopic. You may no longer have enough room. Okay? So you have to specify in what surrounding ambient manifold you are doing the iso isotope. In contrast, homeomorphism, you, when you say something is homeomorphic to another thing, you don't have to specify anything else. So we say, this might be a slightly philosophical statement, but please uh, try to parse the sentence, homeomorphism is an intrinsic property. If you don't know this word, you should look it up in the dictionary. It's a very useful word. Yeah. Whereas, isotopy is an extrinsic property. Again, a useful word, useful concept. Which you should look at the dictionary. Okay. And as I kept saying, it's useful to write down the usual pattern. If you have a large ambient space, or a small ambient space, how easy or difficult it is the isotope gets affected. The larger or the smaller the ambient space ambient manifold, or ambient dimension, let's say, the easier or harder it becomes the isotope. Have you noticed that there are several words here? We started talking about isotopic, that's an adjective. And then isotopy, that's the noun. Now we have to isotope, that's a verb. 
And mathematicians like to you know, make everything into a verb. We sometimes even try to verb nouns.